Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the third in a series of talks we've given on the Revolution of Marlboro. Most of what we know about the Revolution of Marlboro comes from Charles Hudson. Uh, he's got a lot to say about the Revolution. Uh, but I fear that he told uh, only part of the story. Yeah, we're going to have to, yes, it's going to work. All right. So to review, things that we learned in the first two talks. In 1770, Marlboro was an agricultural powerhouse, may very well have been the greatest apple-producing town in all of the Americas. This is something that uh, comes out in the uh, tax valuations that were done by the state. They're now online, and they break down what each uh, town was producing in that period. It's a fascinating, and uh, it, it deserves even more study. But it sh clearly shows how important Marlboro was and how wealthy they were as an agricultural town. The second highest um, land valuations uh, outside of, uh, uh, I think it was Waltham in the Middlesex County. Very, very strong. And apples, driven by the, the demand for apple cider in the tavern industry uh, was what was driving much of the wealth. Uh, almost everybody in town was making apple cider. The beginnings of the East Village could be seen in the businesses of Henry Barnes, who owned the first significant retail store, the first significant manufacturing operation. He had a, a bunch of kilns down there where the first church is now and he was making potash, and what he called it was, um, uh, he, had a, uh, he had his own um, pearl ash that he was making. He added value to everything he did, and he sold it, uh, the pearl ash, I'm sure, much of it went to the, uh, the woolen industry in England. He was also trading in England. Um, so, he may very well have been called the father of downtown, except for one little problem. He was a hated loyalist and wound up being exiled back to England. All right, probably the most important uh, man who wasn't a farmer in town. The story of, those, of Marlboro during those times is told by Charles Hudson, but an important part of the story can also be found in the letters of Christian Barnes, wife of Henry. Christian Barnes' letters are in the Library of Congress. Uh, they're used by uh, many uh, modern writers to tell the story about women in those times. Uh, she was a, uh, a great observer of things, and she was friends with many of the wealthy women in Boston, especially Elizabeth Murray, who could have write her own story. It's a tremendous story, uh, and Elizabeth Murray was a close friend of hers. Another thing we learned was that for some reason, the reason unknown, there was a tremendous increase in the number of horses in Marlboro between 1770 and 1780. All right, we, were, we had hundreds of horses in, in this town in that period. In the 1950s, raising horses was the third uh, greatest industry in Marlboro in the 1950s. So it goes back to that time. Uh, raising horses was behind only apples and shoes in Marlboro in the 1950s. Is that correct, Bob? Race horses. Race horses especially, yes. When Henry Barnes was exiled to England, his potash kilns were turned into saltpeter kilns. A significant militia presence was also in Marlboro, perhaps to support the saltpeter operation. We did some uh, added study on this, went to the archives in Boston, Bob and I and Karen, and uh, we uh, looked at some of these uh, issues in, in, uh, in the archives. and. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, we found some things that were news even to us, uh, things that didn't show up in Charles Hudson's story. Minister Aaron's house was shot at by patriots, and he soon after resigned. 
so it reaches even into the uh, religious life in Marlboro. Money was a huge problem for the farmers in the interior. Marlboro was seriously affected. These are all things we covered in the earlier uh, talks. <clears throat> so, attracting a minister. Aaron Smith is gone. How do you replace him? Well, in Marlboro, it wasn't that simple. It simply wasn't that simple. Reverend Smith had began his ministry in 1740. He had been there for 28 years, 38 years. And the first 20 were okay. Things passed on smoothly. But during the period of the Revolution, he was suspected himself of being a royalist. Not something you wanted to be in Marlboro. Hudson says that in the last 10 years, there were multiple attempts to remove him, but never enough votes. So he clearly had supporters in Marlboro. 1777, shots were fired into his home, presumably by patriots. Health issues caused the town to lower his salary, and finally, these health issues caused him to ask for a dismission in 1778. Retired to Sudbury and died in 1781. So, looking for a new minister, Marlboro had a lengthy history of division when it came to choosing a minister. Oftentimes, chosen candidate would refuse to accept the position because of a close vote. Now, this was before Reverend Smith. Well, of course, word gets around in, in ministerial circles that uh, you drove the last one out. <laughs> so it makes you really not want to uh, sign up. And this is what happened. August 6, 1778, aided by area ministers, they conduct a day of prayer and fasting to help in choosing a new minister. January 1779, chose Mr. Joel Foster. Soon after, a group of 35 men from the east side send a letter indicating that he has very weak support and he should better off not taking the job, which he does. He declines to accept the position. The townspeople, most of whom supported the idea, revoted, and by a large majority voted in favor. But by then he had accepted another position, and that was that. A few years later, April 1781, after another day of prayer and fasting, they chose Reverend, Reverend Ebenezer Grossfenner on a vote of 72 to 67. Now, in many towns, what used to happen going to my friends at the Congregational Church, is they would take a vote, and they would have the results of the vote, and then they would re-vote and make it unanimous. All right? It was just the right thing to do. That way, the incoming minister thinks he has a lot of support. Or at least, if he's not getting support, he doesn't know it. But no, not in Marlboro. You get a vote that's five to the plus, so it shows that there are as many people against you as with you. And what do you do? Well, he declined, obviously because of the close vote. A few years later, 1783, Mr. John Mellon was chosen, but he also declined because of perceived opposition. 1784, Mr. Moses Haven was chosen, but he declined on the advice of his fellow ministers because of want of sufficient encouragement from the town, the coldness and neutrality of many, and the opposition of others, according to Charles Hudson. Finally, 1785, seven years after Mr. Smith had left, they made a call to Reverend Asa Packer to Bridgewater, and he accepted. In many ways, the ideal candidate, he was shot and wounded in the war as a 16-year-old, at the Battle of Harlem Heights. So he was uh, among the patriots. He could not have been a better choice. He was a war hero. Uh, he was actually entered as a fifer, and uh, one of his fellow uh, soldiers traded with him a gun for the fife, and off he went, and he was uh, shot, and uh, the bullet, I believe, remained in him for the remainder of his life. But he was a popular fellow and understood the Patriots, certainly. 
So now we're going to talk about Shays' Rebellion, not because it affected Marlboro that much, more so because it affected one guy in Marlboro that much, one of the people that came into Marlboro. And Shays' Rebellion is Ill illustrative of um, how things were in that time, how serious things were in that time, and uh, how things had to change in the structure of America. And it was very much a local issue. Everybody had to kind of take a side in the local area. So from history.com, this little blurb kind of sums it up very nicely. Shay's Rebellion is the name given to a series of protests in 1786, 1787 by American farmers against state and local enforcement of tax collections and judgments for debt. Although farmers took up arms in states from New Hampshire to South Carolina, the rebellion was most serious in Massachusetts, where bad harvests, economic depression, high taxes threatened farmers with the loss of their farms. The rebellion took its name from its symbolic leader, Daniel Shays of Massachusetts, former captain in the Continental Army. So here's what it looked like locally from Peter Wood, a tax collector. Peter Wood lived in a home um, right across uh, Bolton Street from the Congregational Church, uh, in a very fine home. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that home uh, was from the Revolution, I don't believe so, but he lived in that spot at least uh, in the 1803 map. He was a very important man in town, he's a lawyer, uh, and this is what he said about his own experience as a tax collector. About 1,000 pounds in hard money I had to collect from the town. And a circumstance which rendered it for me was that most people, most of the people in my part of the town were behind in setting with the last preceding collector. They hadn't paid the last taxes yet. I followed the people by night and by day with solicitations and threats but in vain. At length, I took by distress, agreeable to law, to the value of about 100 pounds, the property of those whose taxes were due, and exposed it to sale at Venju, but could not sell it. And it appeared that there was a previous determination, determination among the people to prevent property being taken and sold in that way for the payment of taxes. And I, then being pursued by an execution in an officer's hands and being deceived by the people and drove to extremity and finding no other alternative, I submitted to go to jail, which was attended and followed with such expense and loss as I am unable to bear. They were personally responsible for the taxes that they could not collect. There's a well-respected, um, very important man in town. And I suspect that the, uh, the tax collector from the other side of town had just a bigger problem. <clears throat> Hence, we have Shay's Rebellion. So, most farming in central Massachusetts was subsistence with normally favorable terms. They dealt, uh, especially in the years of the war, they stopped dealing in currency. Uh, you want some of my product, I'll, I'll, I'll give you grain for uh, field implements. You want a horse, I'll give you some, I'll give you some cider. Uh, this is the way it was done. All right, it turned into a very much a trading economy. But along the coast, coast, it was a merchant economy. They worked uh, trading with European goods, and the Europeans wanted hard money. They wanted currency. And because the merchants needed currency, well, it wasn't any good for you to give them corn or cider or anything else that the farmer had to offer. You had to give them hard currency. After the Treaty of 1783, 
The Europeans demanded high currency, and they passed this on to the farmers. This led to a terrible imbalance of payments for all of America and an inability of subsistence farmers to pay debt. And remember now, we're talking about Marlboro, one of the richest farm towns probably in America before the war. And they had to turn into other things. Daniel Shays was a farmhand from Massachusetts when the revolution broke out. During the Continental Army, saw action, the battles of Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill, Saratoga, eventually wounded. 1780, he resigned from the army, and they didn't pay him. Then he had to go home to find himself in court for non-payment of debt. Soon realized he was not alone in his inability to pay, and he began organizing for debt relief. First direct actions were aimed at the courts. Now, if you remember, the uh, Worcester, uh, last year, a few years ago, uh, celebrated the great Worcester Revolution in which they shut down the colonial courts and, uh, of, of, the, uh, of Great Britain and effectively began a movement that isolated uh, the British in Boston. Okay? Uh, the British were afraid to go out. Their first excursion was Lexington Concord. All right, so, but this great movement began in the Worcester, um, uh, Worcester County and the idea was we're going to shut the courts down. Well, the Shades Rebellion, they did the same thing. They started shutting down the courts, first Northampton, then Worcester, Spreads, Great Barrington, and then finally into Middlesex, Concord, Taunton, followed. Local militias refused to intervene. They couldn't get anybody locally because they, they owed money themselves. They weren't going to go fight these people. Eventually, things escalated, and the protesters began to talk of overthrowing the government in Massachusetts. Governor Bowdoin, strongly backed by the merchant class, organizes a mercenary militia led by former G Continental Army General Benjamin Lincoln in a showdown in Springfield. Plan to attack the Springfield Army Armory was intercepted, and the revolution was smashed. Leaders escaped to other states though there were a number of arrests, and we'll see that in a minute. Although it failed, Shays Rebellion had a very large repercussions in American life, since both the threat of rebellion and the obvious unfairness to ordinary citizens were both recognized. It led directly to the Continental Congress, the return of George Washington to public life, a stronger federal government, and steps to repair the American economy. That brings us to one of those figures of Shays' Rebellion, who wasn't from Marlboro, but was one of the revolutionary figures that settled in Marlboro. And that is one Colonel Luke Drury. I, uh, I, ha I have to tell you how I tripped upon Mr. Drury. Uh, was, the first thing I did was I wanted to write a history of my neighborhood. Uh, I lived down in the Ward Park area, and uh, so I wanted to trace uh, who owned the Ward property through time. On the 1803 map is this uh, this notation at the Ward home, and it says Colonel Question Mark Drury. I'm thinking to myself, who the heck is this guy? And what's he doing on this map in the ward, ward house? Because we know that the wards owned the property up till about 1800, and then after that, the Haydens owned the property. So who is this guy in the middle of the whole thing, and why is his name on the map? So I did a little hunting around, didn't have to look far. Colonel Luke Drury has more paper trail than any politician I know. His stuff is all over the place. He's got, um, he's got letters uh, on the North Shore in the uh, Essex Pe uh, uh, Peabody Museum. Thank you. The Essex Peabody Museum. Uh, he had a son who lived there, and uh, 
and many of the son's letters, uh, communication with him, wound up uh, in that library. He's got uh, stuff in Vermont. He's got stuff down in Delaware, I think. And he's got a large uh, collection of stuff at UMass uh, Amherst. And it's interesting because uh, I went, I went, I investigated the stuff in Amherst, and uh, and they had this section, uh, Grafton, right? So I, I'm looking through Grafton. I'm <laughs> saying to myself, it's not Grafton. That's Marlboro. This map is not this is map of Marlboro. <laughs> they had no idea. Uh, so anyway, and we have some stuff here uh, as well. So he turned out to be a very important guy. But he was from Grafton. Born there in 1734, mother died when he was 12, father remarried, uh, and the woman was Mary Ward. So here's the Ward connection. All right, his father married into the Ward family. She died when Luke was in his late teens, but um, you know during his adolescence she was the mother figure. Luke was a farmer, also operated a gristmill. Joined the local militia early on, was a captain, then a colonel during the Revolution. Fought at Lexington, conquered Bunker Hill, continued to serve throughout the war. After the war, he was chosen to represent Grafton at the Worcester County Convention in 1786. So this is the, the precursor to Shays' Rebellion. They got together and met to uh, talk about land reform. When the appeal for reforms were denied, the farmers turned to the more confrontational tactics. It became Shays' Rebellion. Now, his involvement was somewhat mysterious, but after the fighting stopped, he was imprisoned as a person dangerous to the state. Uh, he was released after a few months. But upon his election, election to the House of Representatives from Grafton, he, along with two other Shiites, were not allowed to be seated. They were considered rebels, and they would not be seated in the House. So we had to go through a long legal process, um, pretty much go through the courts again, where he was given the blessing. They said, okay, you're not that bad a guy or something. And, uh, and uh, he was able to play those four games. Uh, just... So he was eventually cleared of charges. In Grafton, he served as constable, deputy sheriff, tax collector, assessor, and selectman had nine children, acted as legal guardian to four minors. Um, there, were, there were the last two wards that I know of were, in fact, uh, minors. And I, the thought entered my mind. Um, their uh, family was wiped out almost, uh, except for the, these two young men. In 1775, they were the last two children of Daniel Ward. Uh, who lived at the Ward House, and they was, that was the last family of wards that lived there. They had been uh, wiped out by dysentery. And I thought to myself, I wonder if these two were one of, with some of these children, but I don't know. He moved to Marlboro with his second wife, Mary Howland, in 1803, and appears on the 1803 map in the Ward House with an odd question mark. So here it is. Uh, you can see... Colonel Drury, Colonel, question mark, Drury, living here. This is what now Ward Park is, where the meeting house was. The Walker Building is here, and uh, and this is just go up the street a little bit, and uh, that's the Hayden House, Ward House. So he he never appeared in his writings or of his work that he ever lived there. He never gave any, gave any indication that he, he lived there. Uh, my guess is that he was acting on behalf of the Ward family. Uh, General Artemis Ward had died a few years earlier. I believe that he owned the property. He had inherited the property. And he died in 1800 or so, maybe 1799. And the, the property was sitting there vacant. And, uh, and then after you see Drury on the 1803 map, the Haydens own it shortly thereafter. Uh, but he buys a property in the west end of town, becomes involved in an attempt to split the town in half 
almost immediately. When he died in 1813, he owned all the land at Hannaford Shopping Center, that whole block of land, all the land across the street, and much of the land to the west and south. All right, we have at the, in the uh, Historical Society, we have his last will and testament and where all this land was, uh, was located. Okay, he owned pretty much the west part of town. Now, we'll talk about how that happened uh, shortly. But you could easily give a talk just on Luke Drury. Uh, he was a very fascinating character. Who else can we talk about? Well, William Dawes, a midnight rider. All right. He took the land route over Boston Neck and met with Paul Revere in Lexington, where they were both taken out of the picture. And of course, Prescott wound up doing all the hard work. He was commissioned second major in the Boston Militia in 1776, saw service as quartermaster in central Massachusetts. Well, we didn't think that this meant that much to us, just that he wound up living in Marlborough after the war. But a little visit to Boston shows that it, something else might have been going on. 1777, he's listed among other residents of Boston, Charlestown, and Roxbury as then residing in Marlboro. Every year, the selectmen of the town had to make an accounting of who lived and how many people lived in their town and how many outsiders. So, among those outsiders are about 20 men, most of them appearing to be involved with the military. Fighting what? The War of Marlboro? The Battle of, what is that? What were they doing here? My belief, my theory, as yet unproven, more to be known and discovered about this, but he was there conducting saltpeter operation for area farmers for the war effort. Saltpeter was an essential ingredient to gunpowder. Um, the young American army was desperate for saltpeter. They eventually uh, were able to get that saltpeter from foreign sources once they you know, got in with the French and, and that. But in the early days of the revolution, um, they set up the guns they got from Ticonderoga on the uh, heights in Dorchester. But uh, that was for show. And when they put them there, they had no gunpowder to fire them. Of course, the English didn't know that, so they saw the guns and they ran. But if they had attacked the guns, good luck to them, because uh, good luck to the, the Americans. They had insufficient gunpowder to shoot the guns. Shortly afterwards, they did uh, start to get some. But um, I think the English were gone by that time. Okay, so, saltpeter. We checked the saltpeter records uh, in Boston. And we, the records indicated that at least 26 farmers from Marlboro and others from the surrounding area received payments for saltpeter from the army. The barns kilns would have been used to process the farmer's wood. Now we know that from, um, from letters uh, in the Barnes family that they were being used for saltpeter operation. All right, we know that that was, that was occurring. We also know that uh, a previous army officer that was in Marlboro uh, was looking for a slave in the Boston papers. So it might have been using some slave labor. Um, we're probably a little bit short of being able to say definitively that that's what happened, but it kind of looks like what happened. Now, we also find among those other 20 or so men that was there was Dawes' brother-in-law, William Cogswell, who wound up purchasing the Barnes home. All right, now, for those of you who, who don't know, the Barnes house was where the fire station, the old fire station, is presently located. So he had that corner office right there 
uh, in, uh, in Marlborough, in the East Village, what would become the East Village, all right? So you have these two men who had no business being there, fighting the Battle of Marlborough. What were they doing there? Uh, and I believe now that they were performing operations for the, for, the, for the military. And this is what eventually led both Dawes and Cogswell to locate here. Now, here's another question I have, unanswerable. I love to do this. Um, where were they staying? Well, we can't say that anybody else was staying at the Barnes house. It was a mansion, considered to be a mansion in those days. Um, but uh, it certainly probably had room for, for a number of these, these men. Uh, they were probably, some were probably staying at the Barnes house. Okay, and so where did Dawes wind up? Well, Dawes wound up at a house at the end of Main Street, located where the telephone building is now located. Okay, that's where the Dawes residence was. So he lived down the street from his sister, essentially, after the war. What year he came here, we don't really know. Huh? But it was appears he came after he finished his military uh, uh, obligations. He moved to Marlboro. Opened a grocery store and died in Marlboro at the age of 53, 1799. Who else was in Marlboro? Well, a man named Colonel James Wesson, born in Sudbury, 1734, moved to Brookline upon his marriage. At the Battle of Oriskany, in New York, he was promoted for bravery. Fought at Saratoga, Saratoga and Monmouth Courthouse. At the latter battle, was struck by a cannonball and had his back peeled of its muscles almost from shoulder to shoulder. Uh, ouch. He continued to serve. Hey, you know, it's just a minor blip. We'll, we'll get out there on your horse again. So he served two more years till 1781 when he is reported deranged. Well, I wonder why. I wonder why. 1784, he purchases 130 acres in northwest, uh, northeast of Marlboro, where he retired. Upon his death, he owned 229 acres. Um, now, I don't know if you have a better opinion, Bob, but I had isolated his uh, location uh, yeah. just beyond uh, to the uh, east of Hosmer Street, um, down beyond the, uh, the uh, beach. Um, he had a house up there, up on the hill. Yeah, that was, is that uh, Murphy Street or whatever that street is? Um, but he owned uh, uh, 229 acres at his, at his death, so he owned a large uh, section of that. There's a lot of stories, additionally. Uh, these three men uh, each could have, uh, easily have a, a full night of investigation. Uh, important people that never, uh, were not raised in Marlboro, but lived in Marlboro after the Revolution, very important people. Died in 1809, he's buried in Spring Hill Cemetery. So, now how do we get from, from the old Marlboro to the present day Marlboro? Um, in time of the Revolution, you didn't have um, a village to speak of, really didn't. You had the, uh, the blacksmith shop in the colonial times was across the street from the meeting house, which was up by the Walker building. Then you had nothing downtown, there was nothing. There was ledge on one side, the north side was all ledge, and the south side was all swamp. So nothing developed there until really the 1850s did that space get filled in, all right? So you, you really didn't have a village experience there to speak of um, up until the time of the Revolution, okay? Until, of course, Henry Barnes comes in. Now Henry Barnes sets up shop and he puts a little store there and he's got all kinds of fine goods coming in from, 
from England. And the, the wealthy people in town, of which there were many, uh, would shop at his store. Until, of course, the Patriots started to complain and, and they wound up driving him out. But he sets up an operation there where there's a lot of activity. He's got the cider mill. He's got the potash works. He's got the retail store. Things are going on on that corner. Okay? And then further down, you have uh, the Sawin Tavern down around the corner going up East Main Street. Okay? So you have other activities going on down there. So you got to start at something going on. What you didn't have was the church. Because the church was, well, the church is on the other side of downtown, almost half a mile away. All right? So it wasn't like many towns. The Walker Building. The Walker Building. Oh, okay. Okay. Where the Walker Building is. Where the Walker Building is. Yes, that was that was where it was until until the 1800s. All right, and nobody had any inclination to move it. Now, usually had the cemetery right next to the. Uh, now you did have a cemetery there in the late 1700s, but at first you didn't. The prime cemetery was always Spring Hill, which was again down in that East Village area. Okay, so how do we get, now how do we get two villages? Obviously, you know, we don't have any, and now we're going to have two. Well, 1796, it was recognized that a new meeting house was needed. The old one was falling down. After deliberation, Spring Hill was chosen for the local, why, why are we going to Spring Hill? You know, we got, we got a perfectly fine location. Now we've got to go down there and, you know, get, you know, boy, you buy some land. Or... Cyrus Felton says that they wanted to locate near the potash kilns of Henry Barnes. Didn't need them anymore. Weren't making saltpeter. What do you need them for? So it must have been public land. They had confiscated it from Henry Barnes. Apparently they still owned it. And they could put it there for cheap money. So, most of all, it was near the economic area of Marlboro. You had William Dawes down there. He had a grocery store, and he still had a, some, uh, Cogswell had a, a shop down there, retail store. Um, it, was a, it was a hot corner. Uh, it was the way you got to the north side of town, where you got to Bolton, to Lancaster. All right? It was kind of at a, a crossroads right there as it is today. But it was almost a half mile further east than the old meeting house, and of course those people from the west would have to walk another 10 minutes all the way down to the other end of town. So immediately the west siders meet and decide to create a second meeting house and if possible separate from the town. Great. The dividing line would have been in Mechanic Street all the way north into Hudson, okay, which was part of Marlboro at the time. Um, so you would have an East Marlboro and a West Marlboro, and nobody would be thinking today about Hudson. All right, you had an East Marlboro and a West Marlboro. And the dividing line would have been Mechanic Street. All right. The Williams family, the Gates family, and Luke Drury were prominent backers of the plan. Drury, as a past member of the House of Representatives, was engaged in the attempt to get the petition passed in the State House, but the petition does fail. So if not for that, we would be East Marlboro and West Marlboro. The petition to open a second meeting house, however, was accepted, and this was built at the corner of present-day Lincoln and Pleasant Streets, where the West Meeting House is there now. A great deal of financial pressure was placed on the West Enders since they were called on to support both the meeting house, both meeting, meeting houses, that is, as, um, as people in the town, they were responsible to build the first meeting house, and by choice, they themselves had to be at the brunt of the second meeting house. Remember, they were just coming out of a depression, uh, and so... Some of them just couldn't carry the load. And who swoops in but Mr. Luke Drury to buy up 
much of that property that we know that he owned. Okay, in that 10 year period, he, he uh, owned acres and acres of land uh, down in that West End that on the 1803 map are owned by, I don't know, 10, 12 other people. Right. Since there were two meeting houses, it was decided that town meetings would have to be located at a third site. Separation of church and state. This is where it happened in Marlboro. All right. And for a while, they just went from house to house. They met at taverns. They met at all kinds of places uh, until they finally built a new meeting, a new meeting house. Okay. But, uh, but this was the end of it. And... Uh, uh, they had other repercussions, as we'll see. Reverend Asa Packard, who lived on West Main Street, pretty near to your house, right, Janet? Oh, yeah. Right. He lived, uh, I believe, uh, where the, the library, library is, the library. where the library is. But notice that that's, they say he lived on the west side. Well, that's just west of Mechanic Street. So that was the dividing line. Uh, he resigns as pastor of the East Church and became pastor of the West Church. Both churches were officially opened in 1806. The East Church, built for the whole town, was now much too big for the few congregants that were left, uh, and in the 1830s was torn down to build a much smaller building. Now that's not the building we see today, because that building burnt down uh, and had to be rebuilt again in the 1850s which is another interesting chapter. In the ensuing years, businesses and factories built up around the two meeting houses and creating, created distinct villages. Okay, when I was growing up, um, the French Canadians up on the hill had uh, almost a separate and distinct uh, life up on French Hill. Um, it was driven more by the alcohol trade probably but um, the, there were, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, Bob, but... Uh, the Irish trade quite a bit, too. Well, the, the, uh, not to say that downtown wasn't built on the alcohol trade either, but, um, but in, in reality, there were very distinct uh, places. Of course, downtown was much bigger uh, than Lincoln Street, but Lincoln Street had its own hardware store, uh, to give you an idea. Uh, and they had many established businesses up there. And uh, uh, the French Canadians, of course, weren't allowed to cross Mechanic Street either. Okay, so now the making of industrial Marlboro. As we, as we saw, uh, Henry Barnes started the industri industry in Marlboro. He had uh, Potash was the leading uh, manufactured chemical product of the age. The first uh, American patent was a uh, recipe for potash. Okay, now people probably don't, you know, understand the word potash, but um, it uh, it was used in large part for cleaning of woolen materials. Okay, the woolen industry used it a lot, um, and. Uh, it has its decedents uh, even now that we use. Uh, anybody can tell me what that might be? Uh, baking soda. Baking soda. Thank you very much, because um, my my mind doesn't work as much as it used to. Um, baking soda is uh, a descendant of potash, and used for many of the same things. So, how did Marlboro become industrial? Well. It had to do with a descendant of one of the uh, great American uh, patriots in Marlboro, uh, William Boyd. Okay, William Boyd is, is all over. He held numerous posts in Marlboro, uh, is prominently figured in the letters of Christian Barnes. He used to go back and forth to Cambridge. Um, he had a, a location down uh, lower uh, Maple Street, it's where the family uh, lived. Um, and one, all of his grandsons got involved, it seemed, in the uh, shoe business, but one was the shining star, Samuel Boyd, uh, who began a tradition of the shoe industry in Marlboro 
in the 1830s. Okay, so uh, after a period of, uh, now th this was a period I would say too where Marlboro uh, had undergone some reversals and the prime reversal was uh, Route 9. Okay, it took the main road away from Marlboro. All right, uh, when, when Route 9, the first great uh, turnpike, uh, literally, the uh, first great turnpike in Massachusetts and in America uh, was built, created a straight line from Boston to Worcester. Didn't meant you didn't have to go through Marlboro. All right, all the cattle went that way. The um, uh, much of the, the hotel business in Marlboro uh, was affected. So, um, so this is, you know, a, a serious blow. And, uh, and then they started to make shoes. Now, shoes, the farmers had always made shoes, so it was kind of a natural. And uh, they brought it to a fine art. And uh, Samuel Boyd was asked at one time, why, why do you want to... You know, you, you got a lot going for you. Why are you doing business in Marlboro? You could be anywhere. You could be in Boston, or, you know, big city. He said, uh, well, it's my home, you know. That was kind of his attitude. So um, he made a big deal about Marlboro and shoes. They built one factory after another. Once cheap labor from Ireland was available, accelerated the efforts and were joined by others. Many of these factories were built by other are the descendants of revolutionary patriots. The stern language against papists noted in the revolutionary documents, you can see it in, in many of the, the uh, things that they wrote in the selectmen, among the selectmen, in official documents, they speak a lot about the problem of the papists. Now this was um, something that they had inherited from their, uh, from their ancestors, okay? Um, and was afforded, uh, was, was awarded to the Anglicans as well as to the Catholics. An interesting thing. And one of Henry Barnes' problems was that he was, uh, he was an Anglican. He wasn't like all the rest of them. He was from Boston originally, came into town, and he was an Anglican. So... So all of those things, you know, the, the, the king, he was a papist, and it eh, didn't matter what religion they were. They, they weren't like them, okay? And this was a problem for the period, those in the period of the revolution. Uh, but it wasn't a problem for their grandchildren because it was their grandchildren who brought in the Catholic Irish, Catholic French Canadians, okay, by the thousands uh, and they had to put that aside. They had to put their grandparents' ideas aside in favor of, well, profit, because it was very, very profitable to them. And it made Marlboro wealthy as well. Much more to be said about Samuel Boyd. Um, Bob gave an excellent talk on Samuel Boyd. Um, he is indeed the father of Marlboro, uh, the city. Um, and built most of it at his own expense. All right, the, the water system, the trolley system, the uh, steam system, uh, he was the moving force of Marlboro. And his great-grandfather was one of the great patriots of Marlboro as well. All right, so we can see that there was somewhat of a progression there. Many of the things that were set up in the revolutionary period even affect us even today about how we locate our buildings and, and live out our local life. But much of what happened in the revolution is still around us. It's still around us. All right? Marlboro is one of the best preserved uh, towns probably in America. And many of the buildings that were there back in those days, are still with us. And they're dotted around town. We're going to look at some of them. 
And this thanks to the work of Chandra Lothian, our, uh, our resident big brain of houses in Marlboro, uh, who's done a tremendous work in, in looking at the uh, paintings that are found down in the library um, and uh, being able to locate many of these buildings. Uh, there are more than we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at the Revolutionary Era locations uh, and buildings and some of our lost buildings as well, um, just as a cleanup to the operation. So first of all, the house of Aaron Smith uh, was located at the corner of Pleasant Street and Main Street, all right, right at the corner, where the uh, St. Mary's Credit Union is there now. Another uh, prime location was the Williams Tavern, of course. George Washington was, uh, stayed here twice. Um, was the center for um, much of the political activity. Probably also the place where they met for, uh, to talk about dividing the town, since the uh, owner uh, at the time, one of the Gates, who had married a Williams, um, I believe owned it at that time. 1800s. The Sons of Liberty used to meet there. Uh, Sons of Liberty surely met there, uh, as well as probably other places in town. So that's down by the lake where D'Angelo's is. House of William Gates, over by across from the lake. A very important uh, revolutionary period family. Uh, and of course, the house of uh, Royalist Henry Barnes. Um, this was, notice the, the relative size of it. it, had a big barn there as well. It probably would have uh, easily housed um, a, a dozen men or so um, for that military operation. Um, and there's a wall in this photo, you can't see it very well here, but you can, you can read this wall, you can see the rocks in it, and you can tell where this, where this building lined up. Uh, with the present day wall, it's still there. So here's the Sawin Tavern. You know, I don't know if, if you know where Sawin Street is. You go up uh, East Main Street just a little bit. So this would have been one of the uh, one of the prime uh, places to uh, create trouble, more than likely. Uh, the Sawins are um, mentioned in in a number of um, stories of the Revolution. So more than likely, they were patriots as well. This burned down wind, Bob. Yeah. So, you know, some of these buildings were, were with us uh, well into the 20th century. So now we have some uh, uh, homes down in the Farm Road area. Um, the, uh, this is a very iconic home. With the, they built a nice stone wall in front of here. So um, this, <laughs> this house was there. Um, the uh, John Bigelow house uh, goes back to the early 1700s. This house was there. Uh, the Morris House, the Morrises were very important political figures uh, almost the whole uh, period of the 18th century. Uh, this house is, was still there. The Daniel Hayden House, uh, which is down where Gulbankians is, okay, it sits behind the, uh, the fields in the corner there. So Daniel Hayden is, is one of those um, although there was a succession of Daniel Haydens, but the one that lived during the Revolution was one of those who sold saltpeter to the army. The uh, Daniel Newton or Dadman homestead, which is buried uh, beyond uh, Broadmeadow Street. Keep going, just keep going straight on Broadmeadow and, and eventually you hit this house. Uh, the Jabez stove down on uh, Spoon Hill Drive. Another eager home. Uh, this is. Another main at home. Uh, down off what uh, Hosmer. Elmer Howe. Union Street. Uh, Union Street. Uh, this is this probably saw a lot of political activity at the time as well. Supply Weeks. That's Ernie's, Ernie's, uh, yeah, Ernie's, neck, of Ernie's 
neighbor. Bring Jenny's neighbor. That is how. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So this is part of the historic Howe properties. Goodman Howe. Oh, right, this is, yeah. That's uh, where John Howe in 1657. Yeah. First location of Marlboro. Ithamar Brigham, uh, Pleasant Street. The little house, Allen Homestead, that was here. So, as we can see, all you got to do is look around. There's plenty of the revolution still with us in Marlboro. I want to thank you all for uh, for putting up with my voice. And <laughs>